Thank you all so much for joining us for week two of the Five Freedom Series. Uh, my name is Emily Voss, and I'll remind everyone that the Five Freedom Series is brought to you by James Madison's Montpelier, the Center for Civic Education, and the First Amendment Museum. And so today we are going to dig into the First Amendment's Freedom of Religion clauses. So freedom of religion is firmly rooted within our American consciousness, and we tend to take it for granted that our right to worship, if and when and where we choose, is one of those inalienable and protected rights. Uh, the First Amendment has two clauses related to religion, one preventing the government establishment of religion, and the other protecting the ability to freely exercise <laughs> Oh, shit. This might sound fairly straightforward, uh, but it's anything but. So we're going to look closely at the religion clauses tonight. Why did the framers choose to put those words in the Constitution? And why are those words important and possibly confusing to us today? Uh, so we are going to find out with the help of our guest speaker, uh, Dr. Vincent Philip Munoz. And Phil Munoz, I have had the immense pleasure to work with many, many times. He's been able to come out to Montpelier to do teacher seminars with us. Um, and we've also been able to do some joint programs with the University of Notre Dame. Uh, so Dr. Munoz is the Tocqueville Associate Professor of Political Science and the concurrent Associate Professor of Law at the University of Notre Dame. He is the founding director of Notre Dame's Center for Citizenship and Constitutional Government. He's also the faculty director of Notre Dame's undergraduate minor in constitutional studies. He writes and teaches across fields of constitutional law, American politics, and political philosophy, with a focus on religious liberty and the American founding. Uh, he won a National Endowment for the Humanities Fellowship to support his forthcoming book on the natural right of religious liberty and the original meanings of the First Amendment's religion clauses, which is scheduled to be published by the University of Chicago Press in 2022. Um, so we could not have a better person to guide us through the religious freedom clauses. Uh, so Dr. Munoz, let me happily hand things over to you. Uh, for our participants this evening, as you have questions, please go ahead and put them in the chat box. Uh, the chat will go to me and to Dr. Munoz. So whenever he has opportunity to pause, we can go ahead and get your questions answered. Uh, so with that, please take it away. <laughs> hey. uh, thank you, uh, Emily. It's a pleasure to be with you uh, this evening, at least it's evening where I am here on the uh, in Indiana on the Eastern uh, time zone. Um, <clears throat> I just want to uh, really thank Montpelier. It, it's a pleasure uh, to be with you. I've lectured out Mont Montpelier many times and uh, now doing Zoom events like this. Um, if you have a chance to get to Montpelier, if you haven't been there, uh, you, should, you should go. It's, it's terrific. Um, if there's any teachers, um, high school teachers, uh, or any teachers uh, in the audience, um, I've had the chance to lecture and teach and work with teachers uh, there on the site, and it's really just an experience that can't be replicated anywhere else to be talking about the Constitution and James Madison, uh, in, you know, on James Madison's, uh, at James Madison's house. There's really nothing else like it. So um, when life gets back to normal, and I hope it gets back to normal soon, I hope you'll go visit Montpelier. I hope uh, we can meet there. All right, so um, this uh, presentation is for the people watching. So I just want to encourage you to ask questions as soon as you have them. And I can stop at any point to address questions. If I cover points that uh, seem confusing or if I'm confusing, um, just stop me. You know, I, uh, I wish we could be together in person, um, but this is really for those of you who are watching, and I guess especially those who are watching live. Um, so um, type your questions away and, and I'll pause whenever one comes in. If it's uh, a good time to stop and I'll, I'll address it when when it's time to address it, okay? Um, so here's what I thought we'd do. I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, history to begin with, um, address the question, why religious freedom? And then we can talk a little bit about, about how the First Amendment came to be. Uh, and then we'll talk about some of the church state cases. Um, uh, our theme for the tonight is religious freedom and the separation of church and state. Uh, and we're gonna talk a lot about constitu I'm sorry, constitutional jurisprudence uh, which can be a bit confusing, especially in the religion clause area. Uh, but again, I want to I want to go where you want to go. So go ahead and uh, submit those questions. Okay, so let, let's um, start with maybe the most obvious place to begin. 
Um, why religious freedom? Uh, we often call it our first freedom. Uh, that's in part because it's uh, in the First Amendment. Uh, but it's also because uh, religious freedom, um, we've long thought, is one of the most important uh, freedoms. Um, we talk about limited government. Uh, one of the reasons government is limited is there are certain things that most of us think, or the founders thought, I think really all of us still think, things that government shouldn't do. We separate church from state. Um, now, what that means is, of course, controversial. Uh, but most of us, I think, would still agree that um, it's not the role of the government to choose uh, church officials, right? Um, the churches choose their own ministers, um, not, the, not the governor or the state legislature. Uh, we don't have minister licenses, for example. Um, we, uh, we all sorts of licenses, a cosmetology license, a law license, a teaching license, but we don't have preaching licenses. And we don't do that because we think that's not the role of government to license preachers. And we, we could go on and on. Um, of course, the interesting questions are, what is legitimate for government to do vis-a-vis -vis religion? And we'll get to some of those questions. But we should start with, why religious freedom? Why do we limit government? Why do we separate church from state? And uh, let me start with the founders and what they thought. And um, I think their arguments are still, still resonate with us today. We might have some new arguments as well. Um, but there's sort of three uh, types of arguments for religious freedom, I can sort of summarize in broad strokes, uh, three different reasons for religious freedom, but they all led to the conclusion of religious freedom. I mean, the founders said religious freedom was a natural right. They said it's an inalienable natural right. And I think they reached that conclusion from uh, different types of reasoning. Uh, the first argument they made, and um, it could be that this was the most popular argument, I'm not altogether sure, uh, was an argument from a biblical religion. Uh, this was an argument made by, uh, you can see it in the uh, sermons of the time, um, mainly Protestant sermons of the time. And to simplify, it's the idea that um, uh, uh, there are, this is from Isaac Bacchus, maybe the most important uh, uh, Baptist minister uh, in Massachusetts in the 1780s. He said, uh, God has no, uh, God presses no soldiers into his army. Right. A, a proper understanding of the Gospels and the New Testament uh, shows that religion must be free and voluntary. And so this was a scriptural basis for religious freedom. You, you can see it earlier than the founding. Um, Elijah Williams, uh, who was a Yale Divinity professor, uh, famously made this argument. A, a fellow named John Leland was influential in Virginia. Um, and the Isaac Bacchus, probably the most influential Baptist preacher. And they all made this argument that a proper understanding of scripture supported the idea that um, religion should be voluntary and free, uh, and therefore it should not be coerced by the, by the state. Okay, I mean, we could, we could say, we could go on and on about this, but that's one argument for religious freedom. A second argument you see um, uh, in some of the more philosophical founders uh, and Thomas Jefferson is probably the best example here. Uh, this is an Enlightenment uh, philosophical argument. You see it in the Virginia Statute for Religious Freedom that was authored by Jefferson and adopted in Virginia in 1786. And this argument follows uh, the, the English political philosopher uh, John Locke. Uh, Locke, uh, in the late uh, uh, 17th century, wrote a, um, uh, what's known as the Letter Concerning Toleration. And among his various arguments, Locke said, uh, the nature of the mind does not allow um, uh, force to, co to coerce opinions. Our opinions, the way our, our mind works is that we, we follow evidence alone. And religion is primarily uh, opinions, opinions about the divine and what we owe to the, to the creator. And so uh, the coercive force of law cannot coerce uh, true faith. So this is not a biblical argument like the, the Protestant theologians were making, uh, but a, an, an epistemological argument. The nature of the functioning of the mind means uh, religion cannot be coerced. The state primarily, uh, in essence, has the coercive force of law. The state can't coerce true belief. Therefore, the state shouldn't coerce true belief. 
Uh, that, in the nutshell, is, is Locke's argument, not his only argument, but his leading argument. And Jefferson uh, follows this argument. We know Jefferson um, read Locke because we have Jefferson's notes on Locke's letter concerning toleration. He literally underlined things and crossed things out and um, wrote his commentary on it. And then we can obviously see Locke's influence in documents like the Virginia Statute for Religious Freedom. Uh, so we have a biblical argument for religious freedom and then a more philosophical or enlightenment uh, Lockean argument for religious freedom. Let me mention one other. I mean, those are maybe the two main arguments you see. I think there's a third argument, and this is more my own uh, uh, scholarship here. Um, I don't know that everyone would agree with me here. Uh, but I think I, I, I present this argument in part because I think it's Madison's argument for religious freedom. Uh, Madison, I think it's fair to say, was sympathetic to many of the Protestant arguments that were made. Uh, and he was certainly sympathetic to the argument that Jefferson and Locke made. Uh, in places, Madison makes that argument too. Um, there's something else that Madison says, though, which is really quite interesting. And I think the, the, the academic way to talk about this is it's ar an argument from natural theology, which is just to say philosophical reasoning about our um, obligations to God. Um, and I'm, I'm just going to sort of summarize what I think that argument is. Um, I, um, Emily mentioned it, a new book I have. I, I write about this in great detail in this book that's about to be published um, called Religious Liberty and the American Founding. Uh, so if you're interested uh, uh, in it going more in depth, to, uh, you can message me and I can, I can send you some material on this. But, but Madison's argument, I think, is something like this. He says, um, let's reflect on human nature and, and what we are as human beings. And he says, we are, we are beings who are, are free and rational. Right? We have a free will uh, and, we're, and we're reasonable beings. We can reason. And given, given what we are, given human nature, how we are created, if there is a creator, what type of worship would a being who created us, what type of worship would that being uh, expect of us? So it's philosophical reasoning about the obligations we owe God by examining human nature, so natural theology. And Madison says, um, given what we are, that is given our human nature, um, it must be given our, our freedom and our, our, our rationality, um, true religion must be religion according to conscience. Uh, conscientious, conscientious conviction. A God who created us free and reasonable won't be fooled by false professions. Right? An, omnipotent, an omnipotent God isn't going to want false worship or worship you um, really don't believe. He's not going to want, God is not going to want uh, the rote recitation of prayers that are meaningless to you or the habitual um, unthinking actions. A, a God who created us with our human nature, our capacity to, this is not his language, but let me summarize it this way. A God who, who created us with the capacity to love, one would expect would want us to love him or love the creator. And that act must be done freely. True worship is worship according to conviction and conscience. Now, you see, that's the same conclusion that the uh, scriptural argument reaches. It's the same conclusion as Jefferson's uh, Enlightenment philosoph uh, philosophical argument re reaches, the epistemological argument. And then Madison, I think, reaches the same conclusion by reasoning about human nature and what human nature reveals about the divine. So you have different paths, but all to the same conclusion, that worship must be free, it ought not to be coerced, and therefore, when we create a government, it ought not have authority over religion. Uh, it ought not punish religious worship. It ought not command religious worship. Okay, so that's the why of religious freedom, at least from the view of the, the founding era. Um, I've sketched this out, you know, very quickly. So obviously, we could go in much more depth, but I think uh, the conclusion that the founders clearly reached. Um, in various ways is that uh, religious liberty is a natural right. And they said it's an inalienable natural right. And therefore we don't give government authority to uh, uh, coerce our religious practices. 
And that really is the foundation of the separation of church and state right there. Now, there are other reasons uh, um, that uh, the founders make uh, more prudential or practical arguments. Uh, um, if you, uh, if the government's going to advance religion, it's going to cause conflict between members of different religions, right? Um, we'll be more peaceful if we agree to disagree and don't try to force anyone to practice a religion. I mean, that's obviously true, right? So the epistemological, the natural theological, and the biblical arguments are, are not the only arguments, but these are the most philosophical and the theological arguments that are made, okay? All right, if you have questions about that, please please ask, okay? So, so they, they came to the conclusion that we have a natural right to religious freedom, a government not, not to coerce religious practices. Uh, how does this translate into the First Amendment? How do we get from those documents, those, that philosophical and theological thinking, uh, to the First Amendment? And that's an interesting story, and a story that's um, more complicated and maybe more unexpected than you might realize. So let me give a, a little bit of context to the First Amendment and talk about how the First Amendment was created, uh, because we kind, of, we kind of forget how it was created, actually. And um, the creation story leads to some interesting conclusions. So again, I'm going to talk in very broad strokes here. Um, uh, you historians out there won't like how, how, uh, how much territory, how much ground I'm covering so quickly. Um, so our first constitution is the Articles of Confederation, our first national constitution. And uh, uh, to tell a long story short, it's a failure for any number of reasons. Um, uh, the central government is not strong enough. It can't collect its own taxes. It relies too much on the states. Uh, so uh, Madison, among others, other leading founders, Hamilton, Washington, um, they meet in Philadelphia to revise the Articles of Confederation, which of course they don't revise the Articles of Confederation. They write a new constitution. And this happens in the summer of 1787. Uh, that new constitution is just a proposal. It's sent to the states for ratification. Uh, the, the rule for ratification is that the new constitution will go into effect when nine out of the 13 states um, approve of it. So it's a state-by-state -state process. The advocates for the new proposed constitution are known as the Federalists. Those against uh, the constitution, against the ratification of the proposed constitution, are known as the Anti-Federalists. Now, the Anti-Federalists thought this was not fair because the Anti-Federalists said, no, we are the true Federalists. Uh, the two sides should be called uh, the, the, um, the rats and the anti-rats. Um, but the Federalists, it turned out to be Federalists and Anti-Federalists. Federalists were a bit more organized. Um, if you've read the Federalist Papers, Federalist Papers are the essays written in defense uh, advocating the proposed constitution, that it, that it be ratified. Um, the Federalists were more organized. Um, some would say they had the better arguments. I mean, that's certainly debatable. Um, but the Constitution was ratified. The Anti-Federalists, though, made uh, many criticisms. And some of those criticisms were uh, powerful enough that the Constitution only became ratified uh, with the promise of, of amendments. Um, now, I should say that the ratification votes were very close. In Massachusetts, uh, the Constitution was ratified by, but you know, I might be wrong on this. I, memory serves me right, the vote was 186 to 167. So I think it was 19 votes. New York, and I'm confident on these numbers, the, the ratifying vote in New York, ratifying the Constitution, was 30 to 27. If two New Yorkers change their votes. The Constitution is not ratified in New York. And the Constitution, as we know it, never really, I mean, it, it wouldn't have gone into effect in New York. If, you don't, if we don't have the Constitution in New York, then that's not going to work. Right? So the, the ratification of the Constitution, which was much narrower than I think we tend to remember, um, it was a real battle. And the, the Federalists only get the Constitution uh, across the finish line. That is, they only get it ratified by promising the Anti-Federalists that there'll, there'll be amendments. OK, now what the Anti-Federalists wanted was a, a, a second constitutional convention. Um, Madison here uh, out, outwits the Anti-Federalists. So we have the Constitution, uh, the first elections for Congress. It turns out the Federalists dominate the first Congress. Madison doesn't want a second Constitutional Convention. He worries that there's a second Constitutional Convention 
uh, the convention will, uh, that convention will do to the constitution that had just been ratified what the constitutional convention did to the Articles of Confederation. That is, they'll rewrite the whole thing and they'll destroy the government before it's even started. So Madison says to his Federalist colleagues, we should write amendments in the first Congress. And that way we'll avoid a second constitutional convention. Now, here's the thing. The Federalists didn't actually think amendments were necessary. So the party that did not think amendments were necessary wrote the Bill of Rights. And we've forgotten this. Well, what does that mean in practice? It means that many of the individuals in the first Congress who wrote the Bill of Rights, I mean, the arguments are, oh, do we really have to do this? We have other things to do. We need to set up the government. And Madison keeps on saying, no, we promise these things. We should adopt them. If we adopt them, then there won't be a second constitutional convention. And finally, he gets his Federalist colleagues to agree, and they adopt, they draft amendments, and they propose them to the states. They get, uh, those amendments get ratified. That's what's known as the Bill of Rights. Here's the important point of all this story. The people who wrote the amendments didn't think they were necessary. There was no great philosophical debate over the exact wording of these amendments. I mean, there was debate, especially with what's known as the Establishment Clause. Um, but it, there was no graduate seminar on the meaning of religious freedom in the first Congress. And we've forgotten that. Well, what does that mean in practice for the Constitution? Uh, the text of the Constitution, uh, the, the text of the First Amendment, as you probably know, is Congress shall make no law respecting an establish of, establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. With this story of ratification, I think what it means for the text of the First Amendment is um, no one in the first Congress was for an establishment of religion. No one thought the national government should establish religion. They could all agree, okay, we like the words respecting and Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment. We all agree with that. There's no need to define with any sort of precision what that means. What about the free exercise of religion? They were all for the free exercise of religion. They could vote in favor of an amendment protecting the free exercise of religion because they didn't even think such an amendment was necessary. And so there was no need to specify in great detail what the free exercise of religion meant. The, the unique politics of the drafting of the First Amendment and the drafting of the Bill of Rights means you, we got text that, that was demanded. I mean, the Anti-Federalist said, look, maybe the national government will establish religion. Maybe they'll violate the free exercise of religion. These were Anti-Federalist complaints and the Federalists said, okay, we'll write this text. No establishment of religion, no, free, uh, no violations of the free exercise of religion. They could all agree on that. They adopted it. But these things, at least I argue, don't have absolutely crystal clear meaning. And the first Congress had no need, given the politics of the time, to, to draft amendments or to have a detailed markup, a detailed explanation, a detailed record. These are what these amendments mean. Right? They just had no need to do so. What that means for us and for the Supreme Court many years later is when the Supreme Court goes to interpret the First Amendment, it's not so, quite, not so clear what these words mean. I have a question that might, um, I think, fit into this pretty well. Um, so one of the questions that came through the chat is kind of ask for some clarification, because in some of the colonial charters, some of the colonies are established specifically for the protection of a certain religion. Some colonies like Pennsylvania are exercising more of a religious freedom policy. And then as the states write their first constitutions, some of them do have established religions. So why does it become necessary if at this sort of federal level to say, well, this, the state of Massachusetts can do whatever it wants but the federal government, no, no, <laughs> you don't get to establish religion for everyone. No, so how did, do you have a sense of like how that thought process worked? Sure, that's very good. And let me just add, um, I'm not seeing the questions that are coming up. I don't know. Questions. They're, they're coming to me. Oh, they're coming to me. <laughs> well, please, Sarah. No, that's a great question. So let me take the first question on 
how many established religions were there at the time of the founding. If you read Supreme Court opinions um, and you read most scholars, uh, what, what they'll say is that six or seven states at the time of the founding had established religions. Um, that's the scholarly consensus. Let me put my cards on the table. I don't think that's right. Um, uh, in fact, I'm trying to get one of my graduate students to, to pursue this question. The assumption is, uh, scholars make, and the Supreme Court has made, if a state funded religion, that's an establishment of religion. And the, the argument goes, well, six or seven states funded religion through taxes in various ways, therefore six or seven states established religion. I don't think that's so clear if you read the historical record. Um, take Massachusetts. Um, they funded religion through tax dollars, but some said that's not an establishment of religion. So what an establishment technically was, was contested at the time. There clearly is one state that established a religion, the 1778 uh, Constitution of South Carolina. And why am I confident that the 1778 Constitution of South Carolina established a religion? Because the 1778 Constitution of South Carolina said the Protestant Christian religion is the established religion of the state. It is the one and only state constitution that uses the word we are establishing Christianity or any religion. So we clearly can say that one state established a religion. Other states had um, different church, states arra church state arrangements. Um, some states restricted office holding based on religion. You had to be a Protestant to be governor or a state senator in Massachusetts. Other states did not. Virginia did not. Some states had a, a system of taxation for religion. This was usually done at the local level. Some states had um, rules for how ministers who were paid for with taxes would be selected. Other states did not. So there was different church state policy at the state level varied. And arguably, this is why we get the language, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment. That is, the clear, obvious meaning of that text is, Congress can't make a religious establishment, and it can make no laws respecting state establishments. If I said to you, um, Congress shall make no law uh, re respecting abortion, we would all understand that with me. Congress has to keep its hands off the subject of abortion. If Congress keeps its hands off the subject of abortion, who gets to legislate for, on abortion? Well, the state governments. Right, so Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment. The most obvious meaning of that text is because whatever church state arrangements should be, they should be done at the state level. And that fits into the type of federal republic that the Constitution created, right? Most questions um, that were not national of character, this is true of slavery, this is true of all sorts of things, were dealt with at the states in the and the consensus was to leave those questions at the states. The various church state arrangements in the various states, the, st the states were not gonna agree on the proper relationship between church and state, but they could agree, we'll leave that question to the states. And I think that's why we get this, no one's been able to quite under explain, why doesn't the First Amendment say, Congress shall not make an establishment or Congress shall not establish a religion? This is very funny language, Congress shall not make Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment. No state constitution uses that language. That insertion of the word respecting, which we know is intentional uh, from the drafting record. You know, there's not been a really good explanation for that. And I think the federalism component probably explains that language. But I'll say here, scholars disagree. Uh, that's a very nice question. Any other questions we should uh, take right now? Uh, that is it for this exact moment. So please okay, carry on. So, so we get this text, right? Um, we can say uh, clearly the founders agreed that religious freedom was a natural right, that it was a good thing, um, that religious freedom required a degree of separation of church and state. Uh, and in their and state level practices varied. Um, I think we can say all those things uh, with confidence about our founding history. Okay, so what does this text mean, this constitutional text mean in practice? And we don't get a Supreme Court opinion until the 1870s, um, right? I mean, and that's part because church state questions were really state level questions. And there's some interesting things in the states. Um, there's some interesting early federal uh, disagreements about whether mail could be delivered on Sundays and things like that. 
but we don't get really a constitutional decision by the Supreme Court until um, 1878 or 1879 is when the opinion comes down. It's a case called Reynolds versus United States. So let me talk about Reynolds, which is the first free exercise clause case, and then I'll talk about um, the first establishment clause case, which, believe it or not, doesn't occur until 1947. So Reynolds is a, a fascinating case. Uh, this fellow, George Reynolds, um, he's um, a member of uh, 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 the Latter-day Saints, uh, the Mormons commonly known. So George Reynolds is a Mormon. Uh, he is out in the federal territory of Utah. Utah's not a state at the time. Uh, now, at the time, uh, Mormons practiced polygamy. I mean, that's not true any longer, but in the 1870s, they did. George Reynolds was asked to take a second wife for religious reasons, clearly bona fide religious reasons. He's asked by um, uh, the church to take a second wife. He does so. He violates a federal law against bigamy and polygamy. It's against federal law. Federal law is governing because this is a federal territory. It's against federal law to have more than uh, one spouse, more than one wife in this case. So George Reynolds is uh, found guilty of practicing polygamy, uh, or bigamy in this case. He is fined $500 and sentenced uh, two, to two years of hard labor. Memory search for that. Uh, George Reynolds files a lawsuit, and he says uh, the First Amendment protects the free exercise of religion. Uh, plural marriage, in this case bigamy, is part of my church's religious practices. There's no doubt about that. It clearly is. Uh, I was practicing my religion. I was exercising my religion. The Constitution protects the free exercise of religion. I have a right to practice my religion and therefore have a plural marriage. And this is the very first case the Supreme Court hears. This sort of sounds oddly contemporary in many ways. The Supreme Court doesn't quite know what to do with this case. Um, and if you read the court opinion, by Chief Justice Waite, he says, it's not altogether clear what the free exercise of religion is. So he says, but we should turn to the founders to understand that. And he turns to Thomas Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson's letter to the Danbury Baptist Association. And in the letter to the Danbury Baptist Association, this is a, a letter that Jefferson writes in um, 1801, I believe, it might be 1802, memory escapes me. Um, Jefferson says the, the legitimate reach of governmental action, uh, the little, legitimate uh, authority of government reaches acts only. You can legislate for acts, not for beliefs. So the act belief distinction. Jefferson also says uh, uh, the First Amendment creates a wall of separation between church and state. This is the famous wall of separation letter, which we'll, we'll talk about in a minute. But here, Jefferson, what the court says, uh, he says, look, uh, following Jefferson, religious beliefs are protected, but religiously motivated, act, mo I'm sorry, religiously motivated action or action is the subject for legislation. Uh, the federal government can rightfully regulate marriage. It can limit marriage to two people, at the time one man and one woman. It can make bigamy and polygamy, polygamy illegal, consistent with the First Amendment. So George Reynolds loses his case. So the outcome of the first free exercise clause is uh, beliefs, religious beliefs are protected from state action, but religiously motivated actions, not necessarily so. Now, is that the most coherent decision, the best decision? Um, arguably, it's not but that's what the Supreme Court came up with. Okay. All right, I invite questions on that. Let me move to the first um, establishment clause case. Now this, we're gonna fast forward all the way to 1947. Uh, fascinating case it's called Everson versus Board of Education. Uh, it took place in New Jersey. So let me, let me give you the facts here. And uh, again, feel free to write your questions as, as we proceed. Okay, so here are the facts of Everson. Uh, Ewing Township in New Jersey uh, wanted to um, make the transportation to uh, high schools safer. Now, there are no school buses at the time. Uh, kids who were go going to high school would uh, ride the, the public buses. And so the Ewing Township says any kid who goes to a, a school in a high school, takes a bus to a high school in 
in our township will reimburse the school bus fare, I mean the public bus fare. I think it's about $35 a year if memory serves me right. Now there are, there are a couple high schools in the township. One is Catholic, uh, one is public. And uh, the township subs will reimburse the transportation costs to both schools. Uh, a, a lawsuit is filed. And uh, there's no question that um, uh, about reimbursing the transportation costs to the public school. But can taxpayer dollars fund the transportation costs to kids coming and going to a Catholic school? That's the question before the court. Again, there are no precedents on the establishment clause. So the question is, um, what is an establishment of religion? Now, let me back up. This is a state case. And of course, the First Amendment begins, um, by a state case, I mean, it involves the action of a state, the state of New Jersey. Um, the First Amendment begins with the word Congress. Congress shall make no law. So how does the First Amendment apply to a state? Well, the 14th Amendment says no state shall um, violate the privileges and immunities of citizens or violate the due process of law. And through a, a very complicated, uh, and some would say not altogether coherent, series of decisions, the Supreme Court said the 14th Amendment, the, 14th, the due process clause of the 14th Amendment, incorporates the rights of uh, present in the Bill of Rights to apply against the states. That's, a, that's known as the Doctrine of Incorporation, uh, goes into effect in the early 20th century. Uh, and provision by provision of the Bill of Rights are incorporated to apply against the states. So by 1947, in fact, this is the case where the Supreme Court does it, the Supreme Court says the First Amendment religion provisions apply against the states. Therefore, the state of New Jersey and all states cannot establish a religion. But what does that mean? Okay, let's go back to Reynolds. Remember how Reynolds, they cited that letter to the, Jefferson's letter to the Danbury Baptist Association? So the Supreme Court says, hey, we've had our church state case before, a Reynolds case. In the Reynolds case, uh, we cited Thomas Jefferson's letter to the Danbury Baptist Association. In that letter, Jefferson also says, uh, uses the phrase, a wall of separation. And the Supreme Court in 1947 says, the Establishment Clause erects a wall of separation between church and state. Now, what does that wall mean? What does it prohibit? Yeah. For all you teachers out there, I recommend this is a uh, church state textbook. Um, it's full of cases. Uh, I happen to be the editor of this. It's just Supreme Court opinions. It's not really, there's all I just, I just wrote the introductions to the cases. Um, so let me read here what uh, the Supreme Court says. And this is um, uh, Justice Black. So I'm going to read here. So this is Everson versus Board of Education. This is the very first Supreme Court opinion on what the Establishment Clause prohibits states and the federal government from doing. Justice Black writes as following. The Establishment of Religion Clause in the First Amendment means at least this. Neither a state nor the federal government can set up a church. Neither can pass laws which aid one religion, aid all religions, or prefer one religion to another. Neither force, neither can force nor influence a person to go to or to remain away from church against his will, or force him to profess a belief or disbelief in any religion. No person can be punished for entertaining or professing religious beliefs or disbeliefs for church attendance or non attendance. No tax in any amount, large or small, can be levied to support any religious activities or institutions, whatever they may be called, or wh whatever form they may adopt to teach or practice religion. Skipping down a little bit. In the words of Jefferson, the clause against establishment of religion by law was an, intended to erect a wall of separation between church and state. The phrase that many focus on is, no tax in any amount, large or small, can be levied to support any religious activities or institution. That's what a wall of separation means. And again, that's Everson versus Board of Education, 1947. Now, now here's the crazy thing. Um, all nine justices agree the First Amendment establishes a wall of separation between church and state. Um, but five justices say New Jersey didn't breach the wall. That is, you can fund kids going to uh, religious schools. The four dissenters say, 
what just happened? You said no tax in any amount and go to support religious activities, religious institutions. This is a ta taxpayer dollars are sending kids to Catholic schools on public buses. You can't do that. So the four dissenters agree with the logic of a wall of separation. They just think that Justice Black and the majority misapply the, the facts of the case um, to that standard. Okay? So it's a 5 4 decision that the kids actually get, the parents get the bus fare. Um, for constitutional purposes, what's important is the wall of separation between church and state. Okay, so, so we have our first set of cases. Uh, the free exercise clause means religious beliefs are protected, but not necessarily religious actions, right? The, the Mormon polygamist lost his case. The establishment clause means a wall of separation between church and state, and what that means in practice is still to be determined. Emily, do we have a, a question? Yes, uh, we, we do. So uh, a question pertaining to some of the perhaps cases that were happening at the state level that you know maybe didn't make it to the, the Supreme Court level. So um, the question pertains to those cases that become famous, um, like the, the Scopes case, where there's a question of whether or not a teacher is compelled to teach intelligent design as part of a state-sponsored curriculum. So are there cases like that that are sort of bubbling up at the state level? They're just not making it to maybe more national prominence? Um, yeah, because it, you're right that it is very surprising that we don't see a national establishment Supreme Court case until the 1940s. <laughs> no, that's a very nice question. And there are state cases and state issues. Um, for example, in New York, a big issue is um, uh, now, now, education at the time is state-centered, right? There's no Department of Education. There's no federal bureaucracy, right? Um, can, can, Catholic, can the state, in this case, New York, fund the Catholic schools? And this is a big issue. And uh, uh, I'm not intimately, uh, I don't have great intimate knowledge of the details of the history in New York. But for a while, Catholic schools were, were getting state money. But then uh, Catholic schools were not getting state money. Um, let me back up. First question is, Actually, the first question is, in the public schools, what Bible will be read? Catholics want Catholic version of the Bible, Protestants want the Protestant version of the Bible. Um, uh, for reasons that are not too hard to understand, uh, the state of New York says the King James Bible. So Catholics start to form their own schools. Then the question is, can state funds be used to support Catholic schools? Right, and, for, and it goes back and forth, but these are political decisions at the state level. I mean, the whole reason we have Catholic schools in America is because the public schools effectively were Protestant schools. Uh, and they weren't non-denominational. I mean, they were just Protestant. And Catholics didn't like that. The Catholics formed their own schools. But all this is happening at the state level, not at the federal level. Uh, and you, I mean, it's very interesting, and various scholars have gone through all these state level questions, which, which, are, which are quite interesting of themselves. Uh, and we have one other question, which you may be getting to later on. And the question is, is the lemon test still in effect? Yeah, well, it is, but we'll get there. Yeah, okay. I mean, <laughs> pause, pause just for a second. So it's getting dark here, and I realize I don't have all, all my lights on. So let me turn on my light so you can see me, because it's about to get very dark. Go ahead. Right? In the meantime, I'll remind everybody, you can go ahead and post your questions um, directly to me whenever you like. Okay. Let's see. I don't know if that improved things at all, but um, sorry about that. Okay, um, so we have these first cases. Um, the next set of cases occur, um, the big cases. I mean, there's some, uh, some other early cases in the 40s. Um, there, let, let me actually pause. There's one other set of cases we should talk about in the 40s. And these involve uh, the Pledge of Allegiance in public schools. And uh, some Je Jehovah Witness uh, children uh, uh, refused to uh, say the Pledge of Allegiance. Um, uh, so it's the flag salute and the Pledge of Allegiance. Technically, those are two separate acts. We usually do them together. Um, and uh, the, Je the parents of these Jehovah Witness kids say, uh, this violates um, the Ten Commandments. Um, we can't worship graven images. And the, the flag salute and Pledge of Allegiance uh, do just that. So they won't allow their kids to say the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, case gets all the way to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court, this is in 1940, uh, the Supreme Court rules against the Jehovah Witness kids. Uh, an opinion by Justice Felix Frankfurter says, um, patriotism is a legitimate state interest. Uh, 
This is 1940. We're about to go to war. Um, uh, a reasonable way to foster patriotism is to have kids do patriotic exercises like the Pledge of Allegiance and, and the Flight Salute. Um, religious freedom does not excuse individuals from the duties of citizenship, he says in 1940. Now, in that case is brought again to the court, basically the same case um, in 1943. In, in the, the court flips, um, but this case is often misinterpreted, even by some Supreme Court justices. Um, in 1943, the court says, okay, these Jehovah Witness school children don't want to say the Pledge of Allegiance. It, they say it's against the religious convictions. But there's another question that we didn't squarely address in 1940. The question is, can we make any school children say the Pledge of Allegiance? And in 1943, the Supreme Court says, no children can be forced to say the Pledge of Allegiance. Freedom to speak also means the freedom not to speak. They, they, they know that, candidly, the opinion is a little bit um, unclear on whether it's freedom of religion or freedom of speech. And the Supreme Court talks about the freedom of the mind and spirit. Um, but anyways, the court rules, no child can be forced to say the Pledge of Allegiance. And they explicitly say, it doesn't matter that these particular children who brought the lawsuit um, had religious objections because no one can be forced to say it. So the Supreme Court reverses itself, but it's not that the Jehovah Witness kids get an exemption from the law, the law can't be enforced on anyone. So, I mean, this is still true today, but um, you cannot punish a child for refusing to salute the flag or say the Pledge of Allegiance. Okay, so let's jump ahead to the 1960s and get some interesting cases in the 1960s, very controversial cases uh, at the time. So um, in many public schools uh, in the 60s, um, uh, prayer was said. Um, in New York, and I want to get the prayer, this is called the Regent Prayer Case. Uh, let's see, I, you know, I, I taught this case a few years ago in New Jersey, and uh, I had in the audience a, a lady, and she remembered the prayer because she remembered saying it when she was in grade school. So this is a case, Engel versus Vital. I just want to get the prayer for you. So this was a prayer that was authored by the regents, basically the, the, the state public officials who run the New York public schools, the regents of New York. It's called the Regents Prayer. And this is what this prayer was said at the beginning of the school day in New York. Almighty God, we acknowledge our dependence upon thee, and we, we beg thy blessing upon, a, upon us, our parents, our teachers, and our country. Very short, simple prayer. Almighty God, we acknowledge our dependence upon thee, and we beg thy blessing upon us, our parents, our teachers, and our country. Okay. So this was said in public schools, 1962. Um, in other school districts, um, over the PA systems, young kids don't probably even know what a PA system is, but you remember there used to be the loudspeaker, the speaker, and the, the principal or a student would talk, and you could hear the voice in the classroom. Um, and some school districts uh, started the day with prayer, usually the Lord's Prayer. Um, others, other school districts started the day with a student reading uh, verses from the Bible. Um, in 1962 and 1963, in two very controversial decisions, the Supreme Court, uh, again citing the wall of separation, says uh, prayer in public school is unconstitutional. Okay. Let me jump ahead. There's a, an important free exercise clause case in 1963, but let me jump ahead to the Lemon Test since there's a question about it. Um, Lemon Test, uh, a case called Lemon v. Kurtzman, it's in the early 70s, I think 1971, if memory serves me right. And this involves public monies, taxpayer money, going to religious schools, specifically Catholic schools. Um, there's a couple different uh, cases involved here, but let me talk about uh, the facts of the New Jersey case. I'm sorry, the Rhode Island case. Um, in Rhode Island in the 70s, um, uh, Catholic state, um, uh, let me back up, what's going on in the 60s? I mean, who taught in Catholic schools? Well, most Catholic schools were taught by um, sisters, by nuns. 
what's happening in the late 60s. Lots of nuns are leaving um, the convent. And this has devastating effects on the Catholic schools. Um, just incidentally, this is one of the reasons why the Catholic schools were so good, because you had nuns were not paid very much. They're paid almost nothing at all. So you had very intelligent women teaching kids at a very reduced rate. I mean, turns out if you can get um, excellent teachers at a very uh, low price, you can have really excellent schools. Um, but when the nuns leave, this creates a crisis. So the state of Rhode Island passes a law, uh, a salary supplement law. Uh, and I'm going to simplify. Uh, basically, uh, this is to help Catholic schools, help religious, help religious schools, but they're almost all Catholic, teach secular subjects, math, science, etc., cetera, um, by supplementing the salaries of, say, the math teacher. Uh, there's all sorts of provisions. The, the teacher in the Catholic school can't make more than the average public school teacher. Can't, the, funds can only, the public funds can only support um, secular subjects, et cetera, et cetera. But the question for the court is, can you use taxpayer money to fund religious education? And the Supreme Court says no. And they issue something called the lemon test. And this is what the question is. And the lemon test has three parts. And if you violate three prongs, if you violate any prong, the law is unconstitutional. Um, to, to be constitution, constitutional, prong one, the law must have a secular legislative purpose. Prong two, uh, the legislation can neither advance nor inhibit religion. That is, the primary effects of the law can neither advance nor inhibit religion. Prong three, um, the law cannot cause an excessive entanglement between church and state, between religion and the government. Here, um, the Supreme Court says, uh, look, um, in order to make sure that this, these public funds don't support religion, the state's going to have to ha supervise the, the religious the instruction and the, the math instruction in the Catholic schools. Right? So in order not to advance religion with public money, um, we're causing an excessive entanglement between church and state. We can't have the state supervising education in a Catholic school. Therefore, the policy is unconstitutional. This is the lemon test is a way to create a doctrine to advance the, the larger idea of a wall of separation. Today, this is known as separationist jurisprudence. Okay? So that's the lemon test. And the lemon test has not been overthrown. I mean, it's um, often ignored, often criticized. Uh, but the Supreme Court has never officially said it's not that I know that the lemon test is um, no longer good law. Um, it's a bit surprising in a way because we know there's at least six votes on the Supreme Court right now, maybe more, to get rid of the lemon test. Um, and several justices have called for it to be uh, disavowed and overturned as a precedent. But as far as I know, the, the court has not done that yet. Again, it's not always used, but it's still sitting there. It keeps on coming back. Uh, Justice Scalia was fond of saying. Okay, um, let's see. I wish I could see you because I don't know if we should press ahead with the Establishment Clause or go back to catch up on the 1963 Free Exercise Clause. But let me pause and Emily, any questions? Yes, so um, some of the some of the questions that have, I'll try to combine them. Um, some of the question has to do with, <laughs> So we have said that it's unconstitutional for a school to require students to participate in prayer. Um, but then the question is, you know, is, is it perfectly allowable then for students to participate in prayer that may be organized by the football team prior to a game or for students to have an organized Bible study as a club? As, is that sort of activity actually a violation or is that totally appropriate because the school is not the one saying it's required? Yeah, no, I mean, those are very good questions, perfectly reasonable questions. Um, I, my heart uh, bleeds for school administrators uh, uh, because the law is not altogether clear in any of these matters. Uh, and let me try to explain uh, why it's unclear. So uh, in 1971, the law of the land is the lemon test. Again, even that test itself, um, uh, does the law have a secular purpose? Does it advance religion? Well, how do you know if it advances religion? Does having a, a student-led or teacher-led 
Bible um, uh, reading group in a public school during the lunch hour. Is there a secular purpose behind that? No. Say, well, you're trying you know, reading the Bible helps kids be respectful and moral. Um, does it advance religion? I, I don't know. Maybe it depends on how good the instruction is, right? Does it? I mean, it's not clear. These tests are not clear. That's part of the problem. Okay. Um, because um, the tests were not clear, and because um, uh, many conservative justices say that this is unfair to religion, you start to get pushback. Um, and uh, Justice Rehnquist in the 1980s um, is, is one of the first justices or other criticisms of Lemon and um, the earlier cases before. But Justice Rehnquist in a case called Wallace v. Jaffrey um, really starts to push back on this idea of a wall of separation. In fact, Rehnquist says the whole wall of separation interpretation of the First Amendment is wrong. The First Amendment was not meant to erect a wall of separation between church and state. First Amendment does not say wall of separation. First Amendment says Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. According to Justice Rehnquist, an establishment of religion meant preferring, in its essence, preferring one religion alone all, over all others. Government, he says, can favor religion generally. They just can't prefer one sect over others. And Rehnquist gave all sorts of historical examples, many of which people found powerful. He says, look, um, look at the practice of the founders. If you read George Washington's inaugural address, I mean, go back, it's easy to find, go read George Washington's inaugural address. Most of it is a prayer. Right? The first official act by the first president is to pray publicly. Congress, Rehnquist says, um, the same week they adopted the First Amendment, adopted legislation um, for a military, I'm sorry, for a legislative chaplain, a congressional chaplain. Uh, the Supreme Court, he says, Rehnquist says, uh, begins its session with a prayer. So we have acts of the legislature, acts of the executive, acts of the judiciary. Um, the practice uh, coming from the founding, consistent with American traditions, is government support of religion in general uh, that non-sectarian non -sectarian support is fine. Um, so the Supreme Court got it wrong, Justice Rehnquist says. They got it wrong in Everson. Uh, so the wall of separation, lemon, all these tests are not appropriate. Okay. Now Rehnquist wrote that as a dissenting opinion. It wasn't a court opinion. Um, Justice O'Connor at this time had also joined the court. And Justice O'Connor um, didn't quite agree with Justice Rehnquist, but she didn't like the lemon test either. And she said, well, really, the, the way to operationalize the Establishment Clause is um, not lemon, but rather government should not endorse religion. She said, that's the underlying idea. Um, government shouldn't choose, in, make people's religious status, um, government can't make people feel like insiders or outsiders based on their religious status or lack of religious status. So that's known as the endorsement test. So, so now we have three different approaches. We have the wall of separation and the lemon test. We have Justice O'Connor's endorsement test, and we have Justice Rehnquist's non-preferentialism. That um, feeds nicely into a follow-on question, which had to do with the school holiday calendar, because most often the school holiday calendars for public schools follow Christian holiday traditions, whereas there might be a substantial number of students who are not Christian or even teachers for that matter, um, who may not be given religious leave days to participate in Jewish traditions or Muslim traditions or something else altogether. So does that start to look problematic when it looks like there's an endorsement of one particular religion? Yeah, so let's let's take a religious display in the town square or in the, in the public school foyer or whatever. You know, you put a Christmas tree up. Is that an endorsement of religion? Oh, well, some people might say yes. Other people might say no. It's hard to know. And one of the criticism of justice criticisms of Justice O'Connor's approach was it's not altogether clear when something's an endorsement of religion or not. All right now, Justice Kennedy uh, himself maintained this criticism. He he's joined the court now, and he says um, while separation is wrong, 
He doesn't really like Justice Rehnquist's non-preferentialism. He says Justice O'Connor's uh, endorsement test doesn't make any sense. Um, so he produces a standard called uh, coercion. Government cannot coerce religion. Um, so now we have four different standards. But then the question is, well, what is, uh, what constitutes coercion? And we get, a, get to a case here uh, in 1992 called Lee versus Weissman. This is, a, 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 there's a public high school graduation. And um, the tradition in this public high school, it's in the Northeast, if I remember correctly, at maybe Connecticut or Rhode Island, I can't quite remember where. Um, they have a, uh, someone come in to say a prayer at the beginning of the um, ceremony. It's a non-denominational, non-sectarian prayer. Um, if you can go read the prayer, uh, again, the case is called Lee versus Weissman. Um, you know, it's kind of like the Regent's Prayer in a way. Now, high school graduation is not mandatory. No one has to be there. And these are high school students, not grade school students. So is a, high a voluntary high school graduation, a prayer out of voluntary high school graduation, constitutional? Well, Justice Kennedy, in a majority opinion, says it's unconstitutional because it psychologically coerces students to pray. The mere fact of them being present um, at graduation where people are asked to stand and pray is coercive, according to Justice Kennedy. Uh, Justice Scalia is also on the court at this point, and Justice Scalia uh, goes ballistic. He says, this is the most ridiculous decision I've ever heard. Um, the students don't even have to be there. In no sense is it coercive. Coercion, what the Establishment Clause is really meant to prohibit, is real coercion. Uh, being thrown in jail or being fined, or being punished in some sort of way. If you don't pray, you don't get your graduation diploma. That would be coercion. But gee, just being asked to stand is not coercive. Uh, Justice Scalia goes on to say, the whole wall of separation idea is nonsense as well. He agrees with Justice Rehnquist. Okay, so let, let's recount. We have wall of separation. We have the lemon test. We have the endorsement test. We have psychological coercion. We have legal coercion. And these are all um, in various times and places written in as precedents of what should uh, the law should be. And so the, the questions, if your question is this constitutional or is that constitutional, it's very hard to know. Okay, I have to say, we're, we're starting to run short on time. We're only in the 1990s right now. It's only gotten more complicated. I was going to say, we should probably launch ahead to the 1990s. <laughs> Okay, so let me let me um, say a few more things about the Establishment Clause here, and then um, go to uh, catch up on the Free Exercise Clause, and we'll get some more questions. And I'm sorry, I mean, you have to understand, usually I have 16 weeks to teach this material, not nine, 90 minutes. So, okay. Um, what happens after O'Connor and Rehnquist and, and now Scalia, they've all left the court? Um, well, um, and there's been a number of different important cases. Um, recent jurisprudence has tended to coalesce around the ideas of neutral, new, uh, neutrality and equality. So one of the questions was, can, can you have a, a school club, uh, a religious, uh, let's say a Bible club in school? And the way the court has been addressing these questions is, well, if, um, uh, if there are other student clubs, you can't discriminate against the religious club. Uh, these are equal access. Um, that's under the guise of the state should be neutral among religion and non-religion, neutral among religions, um, neutral among religions and neutral between religion and non-religion. And that has, um, you could say, our jurisprudence has coalesced around a neutrality norm. Um, what about, um, uh, there's a case a few years ago, a cross, a large cross in, in Maryland, um, these public religious symbols. The court has tended to uphold these symbols. Um, now, why they're upheld, sometimes they say, well, they're not really relig religious anymore, or they're non-coercive, or they've been there for a long time. Uh, there's a Ten, Ten Commandments monument in Texas that was upheld. Um, 
the court has tended to look favorably on, on these types of cases. What about um, funding of uh, religious education, especially Catholic schools or charter schools? Um, the court has said, look, if uh, the funds are distributed in a neutral way, if the funds go to the parents and the parents then send their kids to religious schools, that's okay. So school choice um, is a very narrow decision uh, in the early 2000s, um, five to four, but school choice was found constitutional. In general, the court has been um, less separationist in, in recent years. That's not to say with the change of, uh, change of judges, the jurisprudence wouldn't go back to more separationist. So right now, Justice Sotomayor is the leading separationist, the Wallace separation judge. And you could say Justice Thomas is the uh, leading judge on the other side. And, and the conservatives in this sense are controlling the court. And so the court has been more friendly to religious displays in the public square, um, tax dollars going to religious uh, organizations. And, and the lens they tend to use as equality and neutrality. Okay. That's a oversimplification of a lot of jurisprudence, but there are still cases that um, that are vexing the court, right? Um, uh, the football coach leading the team, uh, leading those team members who want to pray after the football game, um, is that an impermissible uh, advancement of religion, or is this just a coach praying on his own time and maybe he has a free speech right? Those questions are still complicated. It's not clear what the court's going to say. There's cases like that percolating through the courts right now. Okay. Emily, let me take one or two more questions on the Establishment Clause, and I want to make sure we have a little bit of time for the oh, Sure. OK, so I think maybe another sort of category of questions um, has to do with religious exemptions. Okay. So at the moment, we're hearing a lot about that with you know regards to yeah. vaccine choices, but that's clearly come up before when it comes to you know previous laws that um, prevented people from covering their faces or their heads, things like that. So um, sort of very broadly, uh, maybe you could speak to uh, the issue of religious exemptions. <laughs> okay, so let's go back to the free exercise clause. Remember, the very first um, constitutional case was in 19, uh, I'm sorry, in uh, 1878, 1879, on the free exercise of religion. And that's when the court said um, uh, the Mormon practicing polygamy, uh, again, Mormons don't practice polygamy now, but they did then, um, it doesn't have a right to an exemption from federal laws of banning uh, bigamy and polygamy. Uh, fast forward to 1963. And here, this is Justice William Brennan great liberal justice of the second half of the uh, uh, 20th century, he says, well, what is the free exercise of religion? Um, uh, let me tell, talk a little bit about the facts of the case. This, this woman, Adele Sherbert, uh, she worked for a textile factory. And at the time, um, this is in South Carolina, uh, all textile factories had a six day work week. So uh, you worked Monday through Saturday. Uh, Adele Sherbert was a seventh day Adventist. And so she, she couldn't work on Saturday. And she had an arrangement with the textile factory owners that she'd only work five days a week. Well, new owners um, came and uh, took over the company and they told Ms. Sherbert, you must work on, on Saturday, just like everyone else. And Ms. Sherbert said, oh, God, I can't work on Saturday. So she doesn't show up for work. She gets fired. Um, she files for unemployment compensation from the state of South Carolina. The state of South Carolina denies her unemployment compensation. In the state of South Carolina says, look, the law says if you're fired for cause, you don't get unemployment compensation. Uh, you were fired for cause, you didn't show up for work. But Adele Sherbert says, but I couldn't work be because of my religious beliefs. I'm a, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. So the case goes all the way to the Supreme Court. The case is between the state of South Carolina and Mrs. Sherbert. She's not suing her employer. There's no question her employer could fire her for not showing up for work. The question for the court is, is denying Mrs. Sherbert unemployment compensation a violation of the free exercise of religion? And Justice Brennan and six members, uh, six members of the Supreme Court say, to deny Ms. Sherbert this publicly available benefit is the same as fining her for her religious practice. The only reason she uh, got fired was because she wanted to practice her religion. If we don't give her unemployment compensation, it's like we're fining her for her practice of religion. The denial of a benefit, the 
disproportionate impact on religious believers is itself a violation of the free exercise clause. So Mrs. Sherbert got an exemption from the unemployment compensation statute that said, if you're fired for cause, you don't get unemployment insurance. Well, if you're fired for cause, but have a religious reason, you do get your unemployment compensation. And that's where exemptions are born. Uh, today, this is thought to be a conservative approach to the free exercise clause. It was authored by the, the one of the most liberal justices in Supreme Court history. Um, another famous case from the 70s, Wisconsin v. Yoder. Um, this involved Amish parents at, at the time in the 70s. Wisconsin had a mandatory school attendance law. You must send your child to school, whatever school you want, but to school in, until they reach the age of 16. Amish uh, withdrew their children from school after the eighth grade, about age 13 or 14. So Amish parents are being fined every day their kids are not in school. The Supreme Court said, following the Sherbert case, the Amish have a right, free exercise right, a First Amendment right, because it's a religious practice to be exempt from mandatory school attendance laws. At the same time, the, the court is hearing uh, statutory cases on conscientious objections um, from war in the context of Vietnam and the draft. And so the court is solicitous of exemptions. The free exercise clause provides exemptions for religious believers who are disproportionately burdened by otherwise valid laws. So that's where exemptions are born. Exemptions are born in the 60s, that is by the Supreme Court. There's a, there's a long tradition of legislative exemptions, but these are judicial, judicially granted constitutional exemptions. That doesn't start till the 60s. Um, Justice Scalia in 1990 in a case called Smith um, rejects that approach. The case is complicated. Uh, it's much like the Sherbert versus Werner. It involves unemployment compensation. Justice Scalia says, no, uh, the free exercise clause does not provide a right of exemptions as long as the law is um, neutral towards religion and generally applicable. Another case in 1993 um, says, well, if a, no a law is not neutral towards religion, uh, then the First Amendment does provide exemptions. So the, the question for the court now is, is a law truly generally applicable? Uh, is it truly neutral towards religion? If a law is not generally applicable, it's not neutral towards religion, religious believers can have a right to an exemption under the First Amendment. Uh, and of course, something called the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, which is uh, federal legislation, provides what the Sherbert test the exemptions that the Sherbert test used to um, provide. Um, federal statutory law provides that, at least against federal legislation. I just said a lot there. That was probably complicated. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm trying to uh, get through a lot of material here. So it is commonly understood among many people today that religious freedom means exemptions from laws that disproportionately burden religious practice and belief. I think that's probably the common understanding of what, what what religious freedom means today. There's a rich Supreme Court history saying that. Uh, that was liberal jurisprudence starting in the 60s. It's federal legislation in the 90s. And it manifests itself in all sorts of places today, including exemptions from um, the vaccines from COVID-19 or the argument for exemptions. Now, I should say religious believers don't automatically get an exemption in these cases. Um, it's a presumptive right to an exemption. But if the state has what's known as a compelling state interest, um, and they pursue that interest uh, using uh, the least restrictive means, the least oppressive means, then even uh, then a state can still burden a religious believer's practices or beliefs. Again, if there's a compelling state interest, of course, what a compelling state interest is, what are the least restrictive means, uh, those are complicated questions, and it's not clear that there are real legal standards to adjudicate those. Um, this is a criticism of this jurisprudence. It's really standardless. You get an exemption if the justices favor you. You don't if they don't. That's a criticism. I'm not saying that's a valid criticism. That is a criticism that's issued. Um, exemptions, religious freedom meaning exemptions, is, is very much disputed uh, today. Um, the, the current leading precedent is the Smith case. And the Smith case does, says the First Amendment does not provide exemptions. And that, that case was almost overturned last summer in a case called Fulton. Um, I won't go through the details since we're short on time, 
but there are at least four justices, I should say at least three justices, um, probably four, maybe five, who believe that uh, the free exercise clause provides exemptions. Um, Justice Alito wrote a very uh, lengthy opinion signed by Justice Thomas and Justice Gorsuch calling for Smith to be overturned for the First Amendment to provide exemptions. Um, but Justice Barrett and uh, Justice Kavanaugh weren't quite willing to go that far, at least not yet. So that's a lot of material very quickly. I'm sorry if that was confusing. Um, so it's a controversial issue. Scholars are divided, jurists are divided. Um, uh, look, no one agrees about anything on the Establishment Clause or, or the Free Exercise Clause. And I will say there's a real consequence to that, um, a negative consequence. Um, it, it means what our constitutional rights are, are not altogether clear. And that's a real problem, right? Because then you don't know, is, is this activity protected or not? And if you don't know what your rights are, you can't be secure in them. Um, but until we, until we resolve these things, we're left in this situation. Okay, I think we have just over 10 minutes left. I should get as many questions as I can. <laughs> okay, well, um, one, you know, maybe it's more of an observation, but, um, you know, it, it seems with, you know, each passing year, the general demographic of the United States is perhaps more secular um, than it is affiliated with any particular religion. So, you know, perhaps a question could be, do you foresee that impacting decisions going forward if the collective population is, is different than it used to be? <laughs> yeah, I know, that's a, that's a good question. I'm looking for a book here. I don't think I, my, my colleagues, uh, Dave Campbell and Jeff Lehman, uh, two very distinguished political scientists at the University of Notre Dame just published a book called Secular Surge. And it's about this phenomenon, about the growing uh, sort of um, uh, what they call the secularists. And these are sort of re religious non, religious people who don't have a religion or secularism is a religion. And that is definitely a growing trend. Um, where this manifests itself is in politics. So in 1993, I made reference to federal legislation. It's called the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. And this, this was federal legislation that provided exemptions. Um, again, if, if legislation burdened religious people disproportionately, um, it was commonly agreed by across the aisle that religious citizens should get exemptions. I think of the Amish and public mandatory school attendance laws. Uh, no one wants to force the Amish to send their kids to school and when they could do um, um, their own version of vocational education. Um, that consensus, uh, and this legislation in the 1990s, 1993 was bipartisan, I mean, overwhelming majorities. I think the, the vote in the House was you know, 430 something to, to three and the vote in the Senate was 97 one or something like that, overwhelming majorities, President Clinton signed it. There's no way legislation like that would probably pass today or it would be very divided. Uh, and that is in part because of the changing uh, religious character of America. There's a lot of more people who are, who are not religious, uh, a lot of people who are very skeptical of traditional religion. Um, so, yeah, th these questions, these changing religious demographics manifest themselves in politics. What used to be common opinion is no longer common. That's a, thank you. That's a really good, um, a really good take. Um, there's also a question, it's, I mean, it, it relates to religion, but <laughs> um, I think earlier on you were referencing um, religious symbols. Mm -hmm. And so, I have a, a question pertaining to <laughs> images of Satan worshipers. <laughs> so how has the court addressed what is effectively anti-religion in, in the space of, of these discussions of religious freedom? Yeah, no, that, that, that's difficult. Um, so if you have to be neutral mm -hmm. uh, between different religions or treat all competing religions equally, uh, what does that mean for uh, these other groups that don't fall into the category of traditional religion, but um, uh, they made the claim we are a religion. And, um, you know, if you have a city council meeting and you have a practice of uh, beginning the city council meeting with a prayer, um, you can't just 
uh, almost everyone agrees you can't just favor one religious sect. Um, you have to let all uh, comers, um, you know, have be able to issue a prayer or be able to say a prayer. Um, does that include non-traditional religions, such as uh, ones you mentioned? And um, yeah, that's not that's a problem for the court and its doctrines. And those cases are messy and they cause a lot of uh, irritation and anger. Um, often, I presume they're motivated by people who are saying, trying to make the point, we shouldn't have prayers at all. Um, but under current jurisprudence, the Supreme Court hasn't given courts a, a, a tidy way to deal with this. Right. So some people would say, well, we should just shouldn't have prayer. That would be one way to get rid of it. Um, but of course, some people say, well, what about our free speech rights? Isn't that hostility towards religion? Think of all the things we do support, the government does support, all sorts of things. Um, what about, does not diversity, our commitment to diversity include a commitment to religious diversity and religious expression, right? What about inclusiveness? Does that not include traditional religious believers, right? If the, the wall of separation is not very inclusive of religion. So these are real dilemmas that we're trying to, you know, we have not been successful at working through. We have a, another sort of open question um, that in a lot of places, it's sort of standard practice for church property uh, to be exempt from real estate taxes. So is that something that you might foresee there being more of a constitutional question on at large? Um, or is, is that a question that is really more of like the local local state level question? Um, and, and is a exemption of that kind is that even fair? <laughs> yeah, so I mean, um, uh, as far as I know, I pay more property taxes than the University of Notre Dame down the street. That doesn't seem very fair to me, um, but you know, I, I digress. Um, there's a long history of um, exempting churches and other uh, nonprofit groups from uh, taxation. Um, I, there's, I don't think the, the there's going to be no constitutional issue with that. There's. No, no court's going to say um, tax exemptions for churches are unconstitutional, but a state could repeal them, right? These tax exemptions aren't mandatory. Um, tax exemptions for universities are not mandatory. Um, so you could tax the property of churches. You could tax the property of colleges, private colleges. You could tax the property of nonprofits. Um, now, you might get into constitutional questions if um, you said all nonprofits are tax exempt except for churches. You probably can't do that. Right? Um, you can't treat the church worse than um, similarly situated groups. Um, but you could repeal tax exemptions for nonprofits and therefore repeal tax exemptions for churches. These are political questions. I mean, it turns out many questions are just up to the majority. By the way, I think we'll see more, more disputes like this. Uh, I think that's, yeah. that's inevitable, yeah. Well, so that was, I was going to let that be kind of the final question is, you know, looking ahead, whether it's, um, you know, the coming Supreme Court term or just, you know, looking ahead, at, uh, looking out at the landscape, um, what are some of the issues that you think are most likely to rise to the surface of our attention um, when it comes to religious freedom issues? Yeah, there, I mean, there's a really interesting dispute among conservative justices on the Establishment Clause. Um, and you can use Justice Roberts on the one hand and, and Chief Justice Roberts and then Justice Thomas on the other. Um, Justice Thomas is, um, his judicial philosophy is, is very much originalist. And he would say, look, the wall of separation and a lot of these cases we've talked about, the Supreme Court got it wrong in 1947 on the Establishment Clause. And we should just say it was wrong and get rid of all this bad jurisprudence. Um, that's very much not the style of Chief Justice Roberts, who doesn't want to overturn an opinion ever. He's an incrementalist, and therefore he always wants to work within existing precedents, slightly modifying and tweaking. And that's just a different understanding of the, the way the Supreme Court ought to operate in the role of the judge. Um, Justice Thomas doesn't have five votes to overturn all these cases right now. Um, and Justice Roberts is kind of controlling establishment clause jurisprudence. 
but they would they have two very different styles uh, and two very different ways to establish McLaws precedents. Um, so as long as Roberts controls the court, um, we're not going to get a sweeping decision that overturns Everson or Lemon and all these other cases. Again, Lemon's not used so often, but it's never been um, resoundly rejected uh, in an official opinion of the court. On the free exercise clause, uh, here the dispute is, will the Smith case be overturned? Um, again, we know three justices think it should be overturned, uh, maybe four, maybe five. We're going to have to wait for another another opinion. Um, but we could have a change in the makeup of the justices. Uh, you know, the, a lot of them aren't young. Um, and, you know, they'll be changed sooner or later. It depends who, who's president at the time, the makeup of the Senate. And of course, then we have all sorts of political questions. Um, the changing demographics of the, the nation. Um, you know, who knows what's going to happen. Um, so I, you know, I apologize if a lot of this stuff seems unclear. If you, if you, uh, uh, if we're ending this session and you're more confused than you were 90 minutes ago, uh, hey, don't blame me. You blame the Supreme Court. Uh, this is confusing stuff. Um, um, but I'm thankful that you listened to me and, and shared your evening with me. So thank you, and thank you very much to Montpelier. It's a, it's a pleasure and an honor always to work with you. Well, thank you, Dr. Munoz, and I, um, I've appreciated you being able to cover a great deal of material in 90 minutes. Um, yeah, there was a reason we de decided to do a single session for just every little element of the First Amendment, and even that doesn't seem like it's, uh, it's quite long enough. So uh, we look forward to your book coming out next year. It should be a very good read. And in the meantime, um, Dr. Munoz has, has previous books as well that also relate to the founders and their thoughts on uh, freedom of religion. So be sure to look him up in your local bookstore. Um, so for everyone else, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Next week, we are getting into the freedom of the press. And so our guest next week uh, was one of the founders of the Newseum, um, as well as a former COO of USA Today. Um, so we will get into lots of uh, great questions and issues there too. So thank you all again so much and we look forward to seeing you next week. Bye.